glad to see you today, glad to be here. I hope you are as well. Uh, As I said, we are beginning a new series today through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Philippians. It is sandwiched between Ephesians and Colossians in your New Testament. So if you just keep going past the Gospels, Acts and Romans, you'll start to get toward Paul's letters. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians is there between those two two books. So uh, this week I had an interesting experience. Um, Got to go have lunch with a couple of other pastors as we were listening to one of uh, uh, our former congressmen and now someone who works with uh, Faith in Action, or I think that was the name of it, or Families for Action, something like that. Uh, But Jody Heiss was also one of our pastors here, and uh, so I got to have lunch with him and talk with him for a little while. And one of the things that uh, came up that we were talking about was just our culture in general, just culture. There's lots of things in culture you could talk about, but one of the things that keeps striking me about the culture in which we live is our tendency to both divide ourselves and define ourselves how we want, to divide ourselves and define ourselves how we want. Our country itself, um, obviously we're on the heels of a rather contentious presidential debate, and we, our country likes to divide itself between largely two major parties. If you're talking about sports, we definitely want to divide and define ourselves by our favorite teams. But this can even happen in the church, where we have tendencies toward division and redefinition. We want to divide and define ourselves by what we want or what we think is best. We clamor for influence for recognition, for status, in an attempt to build ourselves up. But here's the problem with that. That's not how we were designed to operate. And in Christ, God has already unified us and defined us in him. So whenever we take it upon ourselves to try to divide and define ourselves, we go against work that's already been completed. Okay? So as we begin this new series through the book of Philippians, we're going to see how this book has a particular message for us in our culture today. So let me tell you a little bit about the church there at Philippi. You can read uh, some of the beginnings of the church in Acts chapter 16. But they were a small congregation, a poor congregation, but loving and generous. What was going on in the church there at Philippi was that division was becoming a problem. People were beginning to grumble. There's one uh, verse in there that says, do not, do not be a grumbler. Do not let grumbling overtake you. Um, selfishness became a problem. But even though these were problems in this small church, the glory of God resounded from that church. They were also a very loving and very generous church. They were committed to the mission. They were one of the only churches in Macedonia to support Paul's ministry to take the gospel to other places. So they had a heart for mission, but there were still some issues that they needed to work out together. Now, how, the, how did the church get started? Paul, in Acts chapter 16, they're on their way to uh, a particular city, and they receive a vision. Uh, Paul receives a vision to, from a man of Macedonia. So he says, come and help us. So Paul talks to his team there, and Luke being one of those, because as he writes there in Acts chapter 16, And he says, we concluded that this was the Lord telling us we needed to go to Macedonia, which is where Philippi was. So he says that we sought to go there to preach the gospel. So they set sail from a place called Troas to various cities, finally arriving at Philippi. Now, Philippi is interesting because it's one of the only cities to have a special designation in the Bible. It says in Acts 16, 12, that they are a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Whenever Scripture, there's something in Scripture, it's there for a reason. So we're meant to ask, why is that there? Well, Philippi took its status as a Roman colony very, very proudly. They wore that like a badge of honor. We are a, this, this colony that started uh, as a basically resettling of military veterans from the Roman army, started there, and it began to grow. This, is, this city had the status of a Roman colony. And they begin to find their identity in being more of a Roman colony, and it was divided just like Rome was. So the church had begun to take on some of the personality of the culture, some of the tendencies of the culture. The Roman culture was all about status and recognition, who, as we just read a minute ago, they always asked the question, oh, who's the greatest? 
because everybody wanted to be the greatest. Everybody wanted to climb the ladder of society to be the most important. And what had begun to happen in Philippi in this church is that that was starting to happen too. That the church had adopted this and the church began to say, who's the most important person in the church? Who has the highest status or the highest level, highest position? And that was the attitude that people everywhere were adopting. Can you imagine whenever everybody's vying for position and power, what does that tend to create? Division, right? So that's what is there happening in the church at Philippi. But a part of it was also the question of ultimate allegiance. Because they were, as a Roman colony, their allegiance was to Rome. And Paul wanted to make sure that the church knew, as Christians, our ultimate allegiance is not to the place we live. Our ultimate allegiance is not to a particular uh, person or, or in, in, that's created a particular ruler or anything like that. The saying in Rome was, Caesar is Lord, right? That's allegiance to Caesar. But our citizenship, Paul says in Philippians 3.20 is in heaven. Our Lord is a different Lord. Our Lord is Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, reigning from heaven. So our ultimate allegiance is not to where we live, but it's to who we worship. Our citizenship is from heaven. So as we begin this series, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a citizen of heaven in both who we are and how we live. And as I said, We face this problem of dividing and defining ourselves, ultimate allegiances. Uh, We still have groups that try to define and divide God's people. But as I've said, we've already been defined, and that's what we're going to see today in Philippians 1, 1 through 2. And yes, it's just two verses that we're going to talk through today, but it doesn't mean it's going to be a short sermon, so just buckle up, okay? (laughs) All right, so here's, here's the takeaway for today. As citizens of heaven, we are first saints in Christ, and servants of Christ. As citizens of heaven, we are first saints in Christ and servants of Christ. Citizenship is kind of like the vehicle that's driving the book of Philippians. In Philippians 1.27, Paul says, but let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then in Philippians 3.20, a couple of chapters later, He says, but our citizenship is from heaven. The word that is used in both instances as far as manner of life, how you live, and citizen is the word politeuma, which means citizen. It means where, where you're from, where you get your mannerisms from, how you live, how you walk, the way that you conduct yourself in society and in the church. Our citizenship, our identity, should shape how we live. And our primary calling is to be a citizen of heaven who lives on earth. So first, as saints, we are set apart by our relationship with Jesus. Look with me in verse 1. Paul opens the letter saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As saints, we are set apart by our relationship with Jesus. In other words, we are defined by Christ himself as saints. We cannot define ourselves. No matter how much our culture wants to tell you, you get to say who you are. God has made you. God has made you specifically. He has made you a man or a woman. He has made you in his image. You're designed to reflect his glory. What gets in the way of that is sin. Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the picture, and we begin to reflect more of a fallen world. We begin to be our own gods and think we get to make the calls and call the shots. That's what sin does. But through Christ, we are redefined according to how God intended us to live. We are restored to our nature, and our nature is restored, and we are now redefined and remade in the image of God. We are being set apart as saints who belong to God. That word saints means to be set apart. It means holy ones. You think about the things that are holy in the Old Testament. They were set apart or designated for God as belonging to God. That's what holy means. We like to set ourselves apart for a whole lot of other reasons. 
We like to clamor for recognition and, and, and define what, what makes us important. But what the Bible says makes us important and defines who we are and gives you value is that you are a saint in Christ. You're set apart, set apart first by salvation. Set apart by salvation. Paul says he uses this phrase, in Christ, which is one of his favorites. Each of us are born in Adam. We are born under the reign and the power of sin. Through the gospel, through believing and trusting in Christ, we, be, we move from being in Adam to being in Christ. We are no longer, Romans 6.14 says, under the dominion of sin. Now we're under the dominion and reign of Christ. We are saints, holy ones. You have to think about that Paul had just, he's writing to a people where he had seen some of this take place. The demon-possessed girl who had been, had the demon cast out in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. The Philippian jailer, you remember his time in Philippi where they're singing and they're in prison and they're singing and the doors shake loose and the Philippian jailer is about to take his life and Paul says, no, wait. And he and his household are converted. Paul has seen this change happen. And the people that are there in the church at Philippi knew this is what it means to be in Christ. We have been moved from, our, our ultimate allegiance has been transferred from an, from an idolatrous situation now to the one who reigns, Christ himself. We are in Christ. We are saved. So we're set apart, set apart by salvation, but we're also set apart by our location. Look what he says in the beginning. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. I should tell you what's most important about you is that you're saved. What's most important about you is that you belong to Jesus. But he says, you are at Philippi. You don't belong to Philippi, but you're, you're there. That's where the Lord has you. Scripture has this teaching that, that the Lord determines our boundary lines. And the Lord places us at the times and the places where he intends for us to be. And the Lord has you here this morning. He has you where you live for a reason and a purpose. They're at Philippi. They're there as ambassadors of heaven there. Ambassadors of King Jesus to be a witness to others of the salvation that they enjoy through Christ. So the first position we hold as saints, we are set apart by our relationship to Jesus. Number two, as servants, we serve together for Jesus. As servants, we serve together for Jesus. As we mentioned earlier, we have a bit of a cultural problem that uh, keeps us from wanting to be a servant. The word here for servant is actually the word for slave. Paul says, I, I am a slave of Christ. I, my whole life, Christ gets to determine what happens with me. Christ owns me. He is my master. But we have a cultural issue of pride and entitlement. You know what pride and entitlement do? They put the spotlight on me. They put the spot, it puts the spotlight on you. It means you walk into a room and you're the most important person there. You don't consider the interests of others. The attitude of entitlement means that I feel like I'm deserved or owed something. We, and don't just think, oh, that younger generation. We all have it. Yes. We all deal with this. Yes. Whenever our preferences or our expectations aren't met, you feel that pride and that entitlement start to rear its head. That's what this teaching of being a servant of Christ kind of pushes against. This old man, this old person in us, the, the dead man, as Paul would say, we, ha we have to crucify that man. Whenever he says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The old, old me, the sinful me, is dead. And part of my job in following Christ is to continue, make sure he stays dead. Because he's going to rear his head every once in a while. Sometimes pretty often. But we're, we don't get to determine our status. We don't get to determine our life. That, is, that belongs to the Lord. So rather than being prideful and having a spirit of entitlement... That everyone else must bow to my needs and my, my feelings and whatever else I need. There's a, a different teaching here. 
what does it mean to be a servant? It means that we serve in humility. Now you say, where you, that, humility is not in that verse. Let me show you where it is. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Do you know who Paul was? He was an apostle. And when he writes to the Galatians, he says, I'm an apostle, lest you forget. Here, he takes the low place. He says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. He willingly identifies as being a servant. So we serve in humility. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote that humility, some of us get this backwards. It's kind of, some of us want to be humble and we kind of adopt a self-deprecating mindset. Oh, I'm really nothing. I'm not worth much or anything like that. That's not what humility is. Humility, C.S. Lewis says, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Does that make sense? You're not thinking less of yourself because you're an image bearer of God. You're made in his image. He has good works planned for you, Ephesians chapter 2.10. But it does mean that we begin to start thinking of others more. What they need and what they, this, this is tough. This is not easy. Like I said, we're, we're swimming in a sea of entitlement and pride, and it says, look out for number one. You're in that every day. I've got to look out for number one. But the Bible says it's the other way around. Consider the interests of others just like you do your own. So we serve in humility. But we also serve with others. If you're going to serve with others, you must be humble. <laughs> if you're going to serve with other people, look, he, in the, at the very beginning, he lists his friend his, and his son in the faith, Timothy. Paul and Timothy write this to you. We're a team. We're working together. But then he also says, look, with, this is to the saints at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. The translation is actually together with the overseers and the deacons. So he doesn't put the overseers and the deacons. This is a, a little uh, side note here. This is, the, this is the biblical structure of the church. Overseers, overseers, elders, whenever you see that, pastors in the New Testament, that's all one thing. Overseer, pastor, elder. That's one office. You have overseers, pastors, and deacons. That's what, how the church is led, and, led, by the, led by the pastors and served by the deacons. He brings those two, and you might think, oh, man, if I, if I could just be a deacon, I'd have, I'd, have, man, I'd have some power. No, that's not what a deacon is. A deacon is a servant. That's what the word means. It's meant to serve the church. The reason why they came into being was Acts chapter 6, because the apostles, the leaders, were meant to, they wanted to devote themselves to the teaching of the word and to the prayer. So you have pastors and you have deacons, and he pulls them together and he says, together, all the saints with them. Not as if they're up here, but they're with you, working together, following Jesus together, on mission together. It's not as if they're this some hierarch hierarchical leadership thing where every bit of authority just pushes down on the people. He brings them together and says, you are a church together with one another and you serve together. This is about teamwork. He says, all the saints with the overseers and the deacons. This is key whenever division is a major problem. Whenever some of us want to step out of, I'll come, but I don't want to serve. I'll come to church, but I don't want to, I don't want to contribute to church. We are a church together. Whether you serve by praying, whether you serve by greeting, whether you serve by watching children and investing in children and teaching them the gospel, whether you serve by teaching adults, whether you serve by leading worship. Thank you guys for doing that, by the way. Did a great job this morning. We are in this together for the glory of God and, and the progress of the gospel. So we work with others. And then the other thing here, uh, as servants, we serve to please Jesus. This is about our motive. He says we are servants of Christ. A lot of us maybe serve and have served in the past because we get some sense of satisfaction. Some, it's, and that's sometimes well and good because we know we're honoring the Lord Jesus by our service. And we know we're helping others. But some of us seek out places of service so that we'll get attention. And it's really for us. 
This reminds us, no, no, no. We serve to please Jesus. We serve others because this is what pleases the heart of our Savior who was what? A servant of all. This, again, this term uh, servant means slave. Uh, one commentator kind of illuminates this, and he says up to 95, or 85 to 90 percent of Rome and Italy were either slaves or of slave descent. This wasn't based on ethnicity. This was just based on the fact that this was the way life was back then. They knew what it meant to have a master. We struggle with that concept of Jesus. We like the idea of Jesus being our Savior, of being gentle and lowly of heart, and he is all of that. But he's a master who is gentle and lowly. He is a master who saves. He is a Lord who leads, guides, and protects his people. We don't serve for ourselves. We serve to please Christ. And then number three, as saints and servants, we share in God's grace and peace through Jesus. As saints and servants, we share in God's grace and peace through Jesus. Look with me back in verse 2. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to zero in on one word right there. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Our Father. He's writing to a church that's facing division. They're grumbling against one another. There's actually two ladies in the church. We'll read about them later, Yodi and Syntyche, and they're at it. They're not agreeing. He calls them fellow co-workers in the gospel. But you wouldn't guess it by looking at how they're living. He says, urge them to agree together. Urge them to reconcile. And now, many of us know what it, mean, what it feels like to be at odds with somebody you're not supposed to be at odds with. If you're married and you ever had, I know you've never had these days in your marriage where, where you just feel like you, you're not on the same page. I don't know if it started in the morning or where it started. Something went wrong and it just, the rest of the day feels like it's just off kilter a little bit. Or maybe it's somebody you work with and you're like, man, we're supposed to be on the same page and, and we're just not really seeing eye to eye right now. You know what that feels like, right? It's like what, sometimes just a little marriage thing that I've learned. We haven't been, we've been married for 12 years, my wife and I, um, right? Okay. <laughs> 12 years. And one of the things that I've learned, I'm not great at it. One of the things I've learned is to deal with those things quickly. Whenever you feel like something's off and you're not communicating or there's something in the way, deal with it quickly. And that's what we see in the Bible here. We're meant to deal with these things when they come up. Our tendency is to just, uh, she this, he that, just keep me away from them. But we don't have that option as believers. We have been reconciled to God through Christ. And it is a lie for a rec- someone who is reconciled to God to not be reconciled with their brother or sister in Christ. If I say, this, and this is 1 John, but if I say I have love, but I don't love somebody else, if I don't love my brother or sister, I'm a liar. If I say that I'm reconciled to God, but I'm unwilling to reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ, I'm a liar. Because those things go together. And we share the same father. It's like you don't have the opportunity. Whenever my girls get at it and they're fighting, they don't have the opportunity to just leave the house. Right? They can't just go start their own. Start. They will one day, hopefully. But that right now, not, they're not leaving the house to go do their own thing, go buy their own house and live apart from their sisters. They are forced to work it out. Right? We have the same father. We're a part of the same house. We have to commit to one another to work through those things. So we share the same Father, but we also share the same Lord. And this is huge, the way Paul starts this out, because it's talking about being citizens of heaven. One uh, writer says that to call anyone other than Caesar Lord was probably pretty dangerous in the ancient Roman world. 
because it sets you apart from the normal cultural life. You're supposed to be a part of the, the emperor cult that acknowledged Caesar as Lord, and your ultimate allegiance was to that, that person. Christianity comes along and says, no, Jesus is Lord of Lords, and we submit to him and him alone. That's the kind of master we have. So we share the same Lord. He tells us all what to do, which means his, his word is our authority. There's nobody that stands up here above the word of God. You and I alike are subject to the same commands, the same encouragements together. So we all, we all have to submit to Scripture. And then lastly, we share the same blessings. So here we, we share the same Father. God is our Father, and our Lord is Jesus Christ. We share the same Lord. But look what comes through our Father and through Christ. Grace and peace to you. And anytime you see a you, it looks like it's singular, because that's how we talk to one another, but that's a plural you. You all have access to this, Right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father. The blessings of God. Now, grace is this all-encompassing concept in the, in the New Testament. Grace has to deal with salvation. It has to deal with our daily life, the graces that we experience in life. But all of these things, both grace that we have from God and salvation and the peace that we experience with God, they come through one person. There was this past week... Um, I'm not sure if you read or see or saw uh, the Pope had made a comment that all of these, the Catholic Church Pope, made a comment that all different religions are paths to God. That is not what the Bible says. There is one path to God, and Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But that's also the pathway which with, through which we experience the blessing of God through Christ alone. You won't get, though we serve and though we give, our blessings come through Christ himself. It's not, I don't earn any extra little credits or stars on a board with God. It just elevates me above my brothers and sisters in Christ by serving or giving or this, that, or the other. That comes through Christ our grace and peace that we have and the blessings that we experience comes through Christ as we seek him. And the Lord multiplies the fruit. He multiplies the effectiveness of our work and our service. This grace is, is that everything we stand in, we stand in grace. We took another breath today because of grace. We, we get to enjoy life because of grace. But we also have peace. Now, for any ancient civilization and for any citizen, peace was far to be desired than war. Because what did war mean? There's a chance of, of death. There's a chance of destruction. But the peace that we have comes through God. We are, Romans uh, chapter 5 talks about this peace that we have with God. And we were once enemies of God, once under his wrath, but have been given peace and grace through Jesus Christ. We are now at peace with the Lord. So we share in this together. We're not at war with God. Therefore, we should not be at war with one another. And the tension that I mentioned a moment ago should be something that is brief and temporary that's designed to build our bonds stronger. Sometimes we think, oh, no conflict. Conflict's going to happen. Conflict will happen. You will have trouble, and sometimes it'll be with your neighbor, right? There will be conflict in life. But because of what Christ has done, that conflict doesn't have to, be the, doesn't have to get the last word. You can move toward reconciliation. You can move toward resolving that conflict with one another. So as Paul begins this letter to his, his, his friends there at Philippi, as he begins to talk to them about what it means to be and to live like a citizen of heaven, as he begins to challenge them to be unified, to share in the unity that they have in Christ. He wants to remind them, look, this is not about us. As we begin this journey together, one of my uh, daughters uh, said, Daddy, I love, love going to my new church. I, I think I told Tina that uh, not too long ago. 
my new church. As we begin this journey together, looking forward, we must be committed first to Christ, each of us individually. We must be committed to Christ. We are, and we must remember that we're defined by him. We are all saints, holy ones, set apart from the world and set apart to Christ. We belong to him. But with that comes the call to service. Sometimes serving means sacrificing. Sometimes it means stepping out a little bit of something you're uncomfortable with and starting a connect group. Sometimes it means giving up some time to go and spend with a brother or sister who's hurting. But it it always means we are servants of Christ and servants of each other. We're saints, we're servants. But all of this comes, if, if we're not careful, we can begin drawing on the wrong sources to propel our service and we can burn out. We can just get worn out and tired because we're running on our own energy. We're running on our own strength. We're trying to figure it out ourselves. Paul says the grace that we need and the peace that we need to continue to push on and push forward and press on. Paul's going to say later in Philippians chapter 3, I keep my eyes forward and I keep pressing on toward the prize of Christ Jesus that he's called me it's, uh, in, in Philippians chapter 3. That's what he says. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Because of what Christ has done for me, I will do for others. Because of the gospel, I will serve. Because of the gospel, I understand I am sanctified. I am made holy. I am in Christ. And my friends, that is a secure position. Whenever you realize how secure you are, you are now held by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's no higher status than that. You don't need to walk around trying to clamor for influence and clamor for power and clamor for prestige. You don't need that. Because the one who created it all knows you and loves you. Which is sometimes I think is pretty hard for, to, to love me. But it's amazing that that king, that Lord, would choose me to be saved, but also to serve. Whenever we, whenever we lose that, whenever we lose the amazement that the king of kings and lord, the one who created everything, chose us to serve, sometimes we can, we can forget that we're, we're not all that great. Maybe that's a confession. But Peter tells the church, remember, brothers, not many of you were of noble birth. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. But the Lord chose the weak to shame the strong. The things that are not in the world to shame the things that are. We are servants of Christ. And that is a privileged position. That is an honorable position. My friends, whenever we serve one another from that status, I can take the second place. I can be humble. I can react in a way that doesn't try to defend my own honor. Because guess what? (laughs) Jesus has me. Jesus knows my motives. Jesus knows what's in my heart. I can look at my life and go, you know what? Maybe I do need to apologize. Maybe I do need to reconcile here. I don't have to defend myself. Jesus does all the defending for me that I need. So, maybe today, you just need to recognize who you are. 
You are a saint in Christ. You're secure. You're a holy one. You're set apart for God's work in the world. Maybe you need to wrestle with the fact that that also means you're a servant. And there is something God has gifted you to do. There is some resource God has given you. There is something that God has for you. Because he says in Ephesians 2.10, there's good works prepared for you to walk in them. Maybe you need to think, where is it that I need to serve? Who is it that I need to serve? Or maybe you've been convicted, like I have, and I am every time I read Philippians. And sometimes pride just, there's a little bit too much there. Or there's a little bit too much entitlement. Thinking that I deserve or I should be or this, that, or the other. And maybe we need to confess that. So as we close today, I just want to take a minute. and we're, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to allow you to pray uh, silently to yourself. And then I'm going to pray over us. And then I'm going to have uh, Tina come in and do announcements, and then we will dismiss from there, okay? Father in heaven, you are our Father, and Christ is our Lord, and through you we have grace and peace abundantly. Lord, we are in a privileged position to be called not only your saints who have been saved and who know the joy of your salvation, but also your servants, that you would see fit to draw us into the work you're doing in the world. As you're moving it toward the display of the glory of Christ, the second coming, and the new heavens and the new earth that are coming, as you're doing something new in the world and redeeming your people out of it, you've called us to be a part of that. Lord, I pray that if you're working in hearts today, and as you work in hearts today, that we would commit our lives to you, that we would, if we're convicted about serving in the church or serving in the community or serving a particular person that we know we need to, or that you would give us the energy and the power and the, the will to do that. Lord, if we, we do confess that so often our pride takes over and our desire to be at the center of, the, of attention our desire to be catered to, our desire to, to be important can sometimes get in the way of your work. Lord, help us to be, be a humble people, a people who are willingly ready to take the second place to serve someone else. But Lord, help us to do that knowing that we are already at the highest position. We're seated in the heavens with Christ Lord, we belong to him. We will one day reign with him as co-heirs of it all. There is no higher position than that. So, Lord, help us to serve well, knowing that. So, we confess those things to you today, and as a church, God, we want to be effective for the gospel. Lord, we want to proclaim your word boldly and faithfully, but we want to love people well into the kingdom. So Lord, help us to do that. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.